Good Day Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners, and thank you so much for listening. This week, a special one-on-one conversation between Clay Jenkinson and our, what did you call him, our West Coast correspondent, I believe? For Enlightenment Questions and Exploration, Mr. David McCandry. <laughs> and, and this week, in fact, you do talk about exploration. So here's what's so interesting. You know, when something is discovered, you know, one of Captain Cook's boats in Rhode Island, now the Endeavor uh, in Antarctic waters, um, a mercury capsule that, that sank into the Atlantic Ocean during the space program in the United States, or the Titanic for that matter, when these things are discovered, they produce an enormous worldwide fascination. It's not quite clear why, David, but they do. And it's thrilling to think that the Endeavor, you know, Shackleton was in the Antarctic 1914 to 1917. They got landlocked. He managed to keep all of his men alive under almost, almost impossible circumstances. It's one of the most extraordinary adventures of survival in human history. And the endeavor was crushed by the ice and sank. And you would think that's the end of the story. But there are people that are, we can't explore those regions today, they've been mapped, they've been surveyed, they're occupied. Um, Western civilization has extended its fingers into every corner of the planet. And of course, we've explored space uh, all the way to Mars and beyond. Uh, The new James Webb telescope is producing unbelievable images of the cosmos. Um, And now when something like the Endeavor is discovered, humanity lights up And nobody finds this more interesting than our West Coast Enlightenment correspondent, Mr. David Nicander, who's written books on exploration, his book on Captain Cook, uh, Rediscovered, and his books on on Lewis and Clark are important uh, revisionist looks at these great uh, adventures in our time. And so whenever something like this happens, either he texts me and says, Citizen, we've got to do something on this. Or I text him and say, this is extraordinary. I want to hear your point of view. And then he comes on the Jefferson Hour. And it's always a pure delight because, you know, the way, like, David, like a nine-year-old's interest in dinosaurs, it's the same interest that Nicandri and I have about this sort of thing. And he's really opened worlds to me that I otherwise would not have been able to see myself. And that's the ideal friendship. This is what in the Enlightenment was called the Republic of Letters, that like-minded people find each other and exchange information and and cheer each other on as we examine um, the most some of the most extraordinary things that have happened in the history of human travel. Yeah, it was a great conversation. I was really interested in that, uh, your bit about Gus Grissom and it. It's Isn't that great something? That, you know, yeah, after all of these years that he's been vindicated, he didn't do he it. He didn't screw the pooch, <laughs> as they said, in the right stuff. You know, that the hatch did just blow. You know, he's been, yeah. he's still blamed in popular culture that he panicked. And of course, he did panic a little. We know that. But that doesn't mean that he popped the hatch on that vessel. And then, if you've seen the right stuff, you know that uh, the helicopters tried to keep it afloat because we needed that data. That's the black box yeah. of that early Mercury right. flight. Yeah. And uh, the helicopters were uh, overheating from trying to pull that seawater up. And they eventually had to let it go. And so you think, well, that's the end of that. But human, you know, humans have spent tens of millions of dollars to draw up a capsule that's really of no further scientific importance. It's of some historic importance. And with the Endeavor, I watched a documentary about this about 18 months ago, David, in which this whole group spent millions of dollars trying to find it. and, And they had these these um, submarines that were you know, pilotless that would go down into the depths and they had the sonar devices and the, every, every form of, of um, detection device that humans could possibly amass at, at the cost of millions and they wound up getting nothing. And at the end of the year, they said, well, we don't know. We'll come back. Well, that's kind of the spirit of of human exploration, isn't it? I mean, we don't have to go there. We don't have to find out how all of these things worked out. But as human beings, we want to. We should go to the show. But before we do, I want to tell you that in the past couple of weeks, I think we've got maybe a half a dozen emails from companies that are trying to entice us into getting corporate sponsors for the Jefferson Hour. 
We have never done this. We have always resisted it. And the way we've been able to resist it is uh, through the kind support of our listeners. And that's our intention is to keep it that way. That's sort of a roundabout way for me to say we really appreciate the support that comes in. Um, Clay and I take nothing for for the show. We, we just do this. Uh, none of our guests take anything. Everybody just does it out of a... a a love and an interest in history and uh, uh, American uh, policies, et cetera. But uh, it is you folks that choose to go to jeffersonhour.com and click on donate that keep us sponsor free. We'd like to be sponsor free. On the other hand, if, if Starbucks ponies up and gives us free coffee for life, we'll sell out no, in an instant. No, 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 no. That wasn't supposed to be your last word. No, my last like... word is there's still a couple of places on the France trip that's at the end of September and October. So people should go to the website, jeffersonhour.com. We're morphing into a, a, a broader vision, listening to America. It's an exciting time for you and your career, David. It's a very exciting time in mine. So this is our friend David Nicandri. You remember him from eclipses and the transit of Venus and all things Lewis and Clark. I'll be seeing him on the Lewis and Clark Trail, in fact, next week at Laksaw Lodge. So let's go now to this program about recent rediscoveries in the world of exploration. Thanks for listening, everyone. Welcome to this special one-on-one -on -one edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. It's time to check in with my favorite member of the Republic of Letters, our Enlightenment correspondent, Mr. David McCandry of the state of Washington, formerly the executive director of the Washington State Historical Society, but more to the point for us, the author of several books on Meriwether Lewis and the Lewis and Clark Expedition, and a book on Captain James Cook. Welcome, my friend, Dave. Clay, it's always a delight to see you and to be a part of this program. You know, I, I think about you all the time because I've been really working on questions of the Enlightenment lately, and I know that you share my fascination with the Enlightenment and, and concern about it um, because it's under fire from a number of quarters in our time, and one of the central things of the Enlightenment was exploration. I've been reading about Alexander von Humboldt lately, and I'll tell you, just as we get started, you know, James Ronda and you and I have all said that one of the problems of the Lewis and Clark expedition is that we stay inside the river and we get so involved in what they ate and how many miles they made and where their latrines were and what sort of clothing they wore and what sort of gifts they brought for Native Americans and what discipline problems they had and so on that we sort of forget to contextualize this in the larger history of ideas and the history of exploration. And when <laughs> what I know about Alexander von Humboldt, I mostly know from the past month. And I was ashamed and delighted, Dave, because ashamed because I knew so little before that. I knew who he was. I knew a few things. And then delighted by what an extraordinary genius he was and, and i have to say and i mean no disrespect to our boys lewis and clark but he's the real item i mean he he developed whole sciences plant geography he understood he was one of the pioneers of the idea of ecology uh, he climbed mountains that were more than twenty thousand feet high in the andes the highest that lewis and clark got was about 7300 feet and he self-financed did our friend Humboldt, I mean, I know you don't know a great deal about him either, but I, I dare say more than I do. You can't understand Lewis and Clark, really, unless you understand what a true exploration heavyweight like Captain Cook or Humboldt did. Yeah, I, uh, I, I share your uh, uh, emotions and sensibility about that. I, uh, I mean, I... I'm pleased to have kind of expanded my horizons over the course of the last 10 or 15 years by the work I've done on Alexander McKenzie and more recently, James Cook. But in a way, Clay, it's kind of increased my appetite for uh, exploration even more farther afield. Now, we're, we're going to be talking about Shackleton and the endurance here for the, for the most part. But I know so, I, I too, likewise, I know so, I need to know more about Humboldt I want to know more about um, Speak and Burton in Africa. And what I what I do know, I, I've just found some amazing parallels of their story to the Lewis and Clark story, just for example. But here's the key thing relevant 
for the, the Thomas Jefferson Hour broadcast and podcast. And that in thinking about this, I kind of developed an exploration tree, kind of a genealogy of exploration. And I've come to the conclusion, Clay, and we, we can backfill uh, as need be. Jefferson's actually, a, I mean, we've always known he was a pivotal figure in the exploration of the American West, but actually he's a pivotal figure in the entire reorientation of exploration in the post-Cook era. Jefferson has some key linkages to the reorientation of exploration away from the Oceanic Basin, which dominated Euro European exploration from the time of Henry the Navigator and, the, and, the, and the, if Francis Drake and that whole era, culminating in large measure with Cook. So say from 1492 until the 1770s. 1784 would be my would be my uh, bookend event, and that so that's the first great age of discovery of the oceanic discovery. Yes, and, and there is a second great age of discovery of which Cook is a part, and Lewis and Clark and Mackenzie and all some of the other figures we're going to talk about. But uh, people followed Cook into the Pacific Basin after the the publication of his uh, third voyage account in 1784. But people like Malaspina and La Perouse and some other English navigators, they were always complaining. There was so little left to be done in the Pacific Basin because Cook had done it. And you've only to look at the map in Cook's atlas of the third voyage. I call it the first modern map of the world. Yes, there are some top, there are some anomalies. Didn't get everything perfectly right. And other than, but other than Antarctica, you look at that map and that's our normative understanding of the globe's geography, with the exception, Clay, and this is my point, of the continental interiors. And Jefferson, I've come to conclude, is one of the pivotal figures in the reorientation of exploration out of the oceanic basins and into continental interiors. Lewis and Clark is a part of that, but Jefferson is, the, is a key figure, not solely, but as a key figure in the reorientation of global geographic exploration, and Lewis and Clark is just simply a part of it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So just to enumerate here for a moment, to summarize what you're saying, we think Jefferson and Lewis and Clark, but it was Lewis and Clark, it was Zebulon Pike on the Mississippi and the Arkansas, it was Freeman and Custis on the Red, it was Dunbar and Hunter on the, the Washita. And Jefferson actually wrote a letter saying, we're going to fan out and, and, and we're going to fill the canvas of all the main arteries and the, and the, and the mountain systems and the, and the continental divides and you know, what's fertile and what's not. We're going to do this gigantic uh, inventory and reconnaissance of North America. And Lewis and Clark were only his pet project, but they weren't his only project by any means. Yes, and, and, and there's where my genealogical metaphor comes in, because in my little chart, which I'll show you right here, it's a real thing. <laughs> uh, at the top, I have Jefferson. I have arrows down the ledger, sideways to Humboldt, down to Fremont, because um, Fremont learned about calculating altitude. I mean, one of Humboldt's great inventions was establishing altitude, and he figured out you can do that with a barometer. Now, Nicolette learned that from Humboldt. Nicolette taught Fremont that so that when Fremont is out in the American West in the 1840s, he's not only working horizontally across the plain, he's also measuring the Rocky Mountains in a vertical dimension as well. So we're getting with Fremont a first three-dimensional picture of the continent. Which Lewis and Clark weren't, weren't able to do. They could not, they could not establish elevation. Correct. They can only eyeball it. And let me just stop you there because I want to say something about Humboldt. Lewis and Clark tried to do celestial navigation. They tried to do latitude and longitude. And as you know, their latitude was pretty good. Their longitude was largely indecipherable. Hundreds of hours they spent trying to get this. And, and it turns out the data was not gibberish, but it was indecipherable. I just read this week, Humboldt went to Acapulco in March of 1804. He immediately discerned that Acapulco was off on all Spanish charts by four degrees. He immediately did latitude and longitude studies, and he was so confident, 
He was 100% confident. He issued his findings, and all of the cartographers of Europe immediately changed their maps because of what Humboldt did. Lewis did not have that confidence. If he had tried to suggest that he had that confidence, it wouldn't have been believed. In other words, Humboldt has a genius, has a capacity, has a mastery that is so great that it puts into the shade to a certain degree these amateurs, Lewis and Clark, because Humboldt, what I don't know what it is, uh, Dave, but Humboldt had a kind of gigantic mathematical mastery and confidence that Lewis and Clark simply didn't have. I don't mean any disrespect for Lewis and Clark, but they didn't bring that skill set in the way that he did. Yeah, but he wasn't perfect, nor were any of these people. For example, Humboldt, and there's and this is why this is why I, that's why the the idea of this genealogy and the and the cross fertilization of these explorers over both space and time fascinates me so much, because Humboldt, when he published some of his maps. And I'm not sure when that would have been, first or second decade of the 19th century. One of the things he did was to popularize the idea of the Rio Buenaventura, the notion that there was a river that flowed out of the Rocky Mountains directly westwards that uh, uh, emerged on the Pacific coast somewhere around where San Francisco Bay is. He missed, he missed the Great Basin. He could not understand the Great Basin. Yes, and there's where Fremont comes in. because But that vast area in between, water gets in, but it doesn't go out. That's why those lakes become salted, uh, because yes. there's no refreshing of them in the way that they would have that opportunity if the water actually passed to the sea. And so if Humboldt misunderstood that, and by the way, there's a Great Basin River name for Humboldt that starts in the mountains and winds up just petering out. It just dries up in the middle of Nevada, one of my favorite places. Uh, and by the way, there are more places in the world named for Humboldt than any other figure ever. Think of his influence. But 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 if he thought there was a river Buenaventura, it was a logical thing to think. It just took someone on the ground to, dis to dispute it. Yes, and what, and, uh, and all scientists, uh, philosopher, naturalists, I mean to say natural philosophy, uh, th they, as scientists do today, they work with certain hypotheses. And the reigning hypotheses that informed this misjudgment were the principles of equipoise and counterpoise, that if there was a feature on one side of the continent, very likely there was something just like that or approximate to that on the other side of the continent. Most famously, that played out in Lewis and Clark lore, with the Western mountains, the Rockies, being the approximate size and expanse that the Appalachians were, a famous miscalculation. Yes, we're gonna take a break here, but remember too that when Lewis got near the source of the Missouri, he knew that there would be a counter river on the other side, but he it was a very smart man and he thought, uh-oh, our longitude is very far west. That means that the distance from the mountaintops to the Pacific is gonna be more precipitous and the rivers on the western side are gonna be harder to navigate and maybe not navigable because they have to do all their gravitational work in a shortened amount of geographic space. So that was shrewd thinking on Lewis's part. And of course they did have difficulties when they got to the western flank of the Rockies. Indeed, very well put. All right, we're gonna take a short break. We're talking to our friend, David Nicandri. Uh, we haven't yet gotten to Shackleton and the Endurance, but I promise you we will. You're listening to a special one-on-one -on -one edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkinson. Sitting across from me virtually is my dear friend and partner in adventures, Mr. David McCandry, formerly the executive director of the Washington State Historical Society, a frequent guest on this program, a man who is an inspiration to me and others because when you had finished your career as a director of a, an important historical society and museum, you suddenly blossomed into this writer. And now every time I talk with you, you have a new book project that you're in contemplation of. I don't think there's enough time left for you to write all the books that you have in mind. That, that has actually begun to worry me, but I'm just going to keep plugging away and as, with as many innings as I get, I'm just going to keep batting. Well, there we go to a sports metaphor. Now, I think something that most people don't know about you and really shocked and disappointed me 
was you are a not infrequent guest on Mad Dog's radio sports program. What's that thing called? Well, I'm not a guest. I'm a, I'm a, I'm one. I think I'm one of his favorite callers. He said as much. Um, I, 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 and I always, when he has authors, I, cause it's a sports, it's a sports talk radio show. It's Mad Dog Russo, isn't it? Yes. Christopher Mad Dog Russo. It's called Mad Dog Radio. I'm supposing and, he got that nickname, not because he's a gentle and, and serene man. No, he goes on very voluble rants about various topics uh, in, involving the sport world. So I'm not the most regular caller, but I like to think that when I call in, he sees my name in the queue and he brings up Dave from the state of Washington. So we won't go down that path any farther, but people who want to can listen daily to Mad Dog uh, on Sirius Radio and uh, someday they'll hear you uh, chortling from the Pacific Coast somewhere about something about whether Steph Curry is the greatest this or that uh, and so on. But back to this, you mentioned something in the first segment that I want to get to before we move to Shackleton uh, because there's news in the Shackleton world. But you mentioned Speak and Burton. I am utterly obsessed with Burton. He is one of the most extraordinary men who ever lived on earth, I think. He knew 29 languages he wrote two volumes on almost every adventure that he was ever on. He was the first uh, person to penetrate to Mecca in disguise as a Muslim. He uh, went to Great Salt Lake. He wanted to see what the LDS world, the Mormon world, the polygamy looked like. He was one of the searchers for the source of the Nile in the 1850s, and he didn't quite find the source. He got close. He thought it was Lake Tanganyika. He was wrong about that. And he had, along with him, this sort of typical British guy who didn't really know languages and didn't really know much, but he had the right kind of physical capacity. His name was John Speak, and they were both deathly ill uh, on the shores of Lake Tanganyika, and Speak got a little better sooner, and he said, I say, old chap, do you mind if I go up? Uh, there's apparently a, a lake north of here that I think might be worth taking a look at. Burton said, go right ahead, Speak accidentally bumbles into Lake Victoria and discovers the source of the Nile. This led to one of the most bitter intellectual controversies of the modern times. And they eventually were each writing books and counter books. People took sides. This was, you can't imagine how big this was as a scandal and controversy in 19th century Britain. And it turns out Speak won the prize. He is the one who essentially accidentally discovered the source of the Nile. The Nile isn't actually Lake Victoria, but it essentially is. And Burton never got over this uh, because he was infinitely more interesting, better educated, a better linguist, a better anthropologist, a better ethnologist, better at everything than Speak. But his body didn't hold up quite the way that Speaks did in that important moment. And I love that story, and I can never get enough of it. And now Candace Millard, who has written a number of uh, books, has gotten there ahead of me. I so wanted to write about this. She's about to publish a book on the search for the source of the Nile, and I know from her previous books, Dave, that it's going to be outstanding. Yeah, I got the idea of Jefferson as the progenitor of, in, of interior, continental interior exploration. So let me just finish that thought, Clay. So Jefferson convinces Ledger, who had traveled with Cook, to become more interested in continental interiors. The original idea is to go across Eurasia, then cross North America. The Empress Catherine kicks Ledger out. So that uh, Ledger kind of kicks around a while. And, and that was originally Jefferson's idea. But then Ledger falls, he falls into the allure of trying to find the headwaters of African rivers the Niger, but to get there, he has to go up the Nile and he dies before he can even take that expedition. So I see a link between Jefferson, the ledger, to speak in Burton, but I see certain echoes from the Lewis and Clark story. So you have two people leading an, ex an expedition deep into the continental interior. Well, who does that remind you of? You have one person jumping out ahead of the other. Well, what does that remind? I wrote a whole book about that in the case of Lewis always jumping ahead of Clark. And then you have one of them dying under mysterious circumstances. What does that remind? So Speak dies of a gunshot wound 
uh, self-inflicted, but not necessarily suicide. He dies actually on the day that he's to have the big debate in Bath in England with uh, Burton. People blame Burton. Burton really had nothing to do with it. But as you say, there was this competition, which there is in exploration. Who gets to be first? Who gets to be the one? Who is Neil Armstrong? And which person has to settle for being Buzz Aldrin? And so speak and Burton were contesting this. As you say, the parallels with Lewis and Clark are really meaningful. So here's our segue, Clegg. We'll, so we'll, get to, we'll get to Shackleton this way. So Jefferson through Ledger is part of a shift to continental interiors. Jefferson meets with Humboldt. Humboldt does South America, Central America. Speak and Burton do Africa. What's left? Antarctica, which Cook had gained an intimation of, and we might be able to get to that later, but Charles Wilkes, an American explorer, finds the continental dimensions thereof in the early 1840s, and then being a, a determining that the South Pole is not at sea under ice, but a, a part of a continental landmass, and then the race, the last, one of the last pieces of, of the unknown uh, geography of the world is the great Southern continent, which is not mid-latitude, high latitude that Cook was looking for, but in fact, a vast polar southern continent. And that's where Shackleton comes into our story. Okay, a couple of quick things. One is Antarctica is a continent, not an island. It's not an ice island. The Arctic is not the same. Correct. Antarctica is a continent that's bound by ice. It is at least as large as Australia and maybe larger. I don't know the exact dimensions, but it's considered to be of continental proportions. But the Arctic is the Arctic is ice. It's just an ice-covered sea. So if it melts, that's going to be open water. Open water. Become the new Mediterranean by the 22nd century. If the Antarctic melts, there's going to be a continent there of land. And a lot more water in the world's oceans. Humboldt comes to Philadelphia and then Washington, D.C. in June of 1804. He comes there from Cuba on his way back to France because he wants to meet the great Thomas Jefferson. He has that much respect for Jefferson, and they have these encounters, which I wish we knew more about. There was no James Boswell, but we know a little bit about it. They talked about mammoths. They talked about longitude. They talked about uh, Buffon's degeneracy theory and so on. They talked about Mexico, and actually Jefferson was fascinated by Humboldt's account because Jefferson was trying to figure out the southwestern boundaries of the Louisiana Purchase. Humboldt was in a position to really inform him. And in fact, what we what Jefferson knew about Texas, he essentially learned from Humboldt. But here's the thing. This is a what if. Imagine if Lewis and Clark started a year later and Humboldt and Lewis had met in the White House. Imagine what that briefing would have been, Dave. And, and then just let me see if I can blow your mind. What if Humboldt became the Joseph Banks of this story and Lewis was the military commander, but Humboldt went along as the scientist? That would be the most amazing. I don't think Jefferson would have allowed it, frankly, but that would have been the most amazing development ever. But, Clay, to the point, it's an entirely plausible scenario. It's just that the chronology didn't work out correctly. By one year. By one year. And Humboldt would have told us the latitude and longitude of everything. Yeah. You know, he made those sectional maps in Mexico and in the Andes that are world class. He invented this, the idea of, of showing in a large horizontal framework the different heights of different mountain ranges and valleys. Uh, so it, it's just one of those tantalizing what ifs. So now let us turn to this recent discovery, an amazing discovery. You know, so the Endurance was Shackleton's vessel in Antarctica. It was abandoned. It sank. Nobody knew quite where. Recently, after years of reconnaissance, it has been discovered and discovered largely intact. So first of all, set the scene. Shackleton was born around 1875, I want to say. Uh, he was an Anglo-Irishman. His family had its roots in England. They were Yorkshiremen, which, by the way, is where Cook hailed from. Uh, Shackleton himself was born in Ireland. Uh, like Cook, he started in commercial naval service. He joined the Royal Navy relatively deep into his career, again, like Cook. Uh, he joined the Royal Navy in 1901, 
and was quickly posted to Robert Falcon Scott's first Antarctic expedition. So Scott's first expedition reaches 82 south. Uh, of course, 90 south would be the pole. That's the, that's the ultimate goal. Shackleton himself leads his first expedition, but the second Antarctic, Antarctic expedition he's been on in command of a boat or a ship called the Nimrod, um, uh, 1907, I want to say, thereabouts. Uh, he, he and people attached to him get even farther south, 88 degrees, 90 miles short of the goal. For that, he's knighted the great contest between Roald Amundsen and Scott, again, uh, Robert Falcon Scott, to which Shackleton's not attached, takes place over the course of the winter of 1911 and 12. Amundsen, it's a whole story in itself, beats Scott. Amundsen makes it back. Scott and some most of his people die. Kind of a great Edwardian England tragedy. So Shackleton, subsequent, and they, Amundsen and Scott both reached the pole, South Pole. Amundsen lived to tell about it. Scott only did through his journal. And so Shackleton's second expedition that he's leading, but the third that he has been on, it's called the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition leaves in 1914, and that's the one. Uh, he's not actually the captain of the boat. I mean, there's some, Frank Worsley, I think, is the captain, but Shackleton's the head of the expedition. That's kind of the same model Bougainville used with his great exploration for France in the age of Cook. So the pole, the pole, David, the the pole has been found. And so what is Shackleton doing on that on that second of his expeditions? Shackleton's trying to be the first to cross from one side of the continent to the other by way of the South Pole. But it's it's a it's a Ledyardian kind of quest. It's crossing terrain just for the sake of doing so. That's why I maintain all of these things. There's there's an intellectual history and uh, to all of these processes. It's kind of a romantic quest. There's nothing really more to be discovered other than to say one did it. And so he sails south in 1914, the week after World War I breaks out, and no less a figure than Winston Churchill, who was at that time First Lord of the Admiralty, says Shackleton, go on, get this done. And so Shackleton sails south in 1914. The ship gets stuck and the endurance gets stuck in the ice. So he makes it all the way from Britain to Antarctica, where they're going to disembark and cross the continent by land. They get down there, and their ship gets trapped in the ice. Eventually, they're forced to abandon it. Now, they're approaching the Antarctica from the South American side of the continent, and they're trying to emerge on the Australia-New Zealand side of Antarctica. So he's in what's known as the Weddell Sea, gets trapped in the ice. The ice... Uh, it's, it's a big gyre. It starts taking him back from where he came. It's taking him northward. They have to abandon the ship. They're, they're stuck on an ice flow for a few weeks, if not a month. And finally, Shackleton says, we've got to find land. And they go to Elephant Island, which is one of the South Orkney Islands, which the whalers and sealers in the 19th century uh, had located. And that's where the real drama begins. How long, essentially, would that hike have been across the Antarctic mainland to get to the Australian side of that continent? Is that a thousand well, miles? Oh yeah, easily. It would have taken. Uh, yeah, it would have taken. Oh, boy, um, uh, yeah, it's more than a thousand miles. I'm sure it would have taken weeks, if not a couple of months, to do. I'm guessing, but I don't know specifically. So they get down there, and, and as I understand it, you know the the seas are kind of freezing and not freezing, and the ice flows are moving, and you're kind of maneuvering through and hoping that you can get out in time and not be trapped. And this this sort of drama repeats itself in the Arctic and the Antarctic. So they get trapped. And they manage, and the ice is moving, so the ice can actually carry along whole, what appears to be solid ice is moving as an island in currents that are not fully understood at that time. Correct. And hundreds of miles farther north, almost to the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. And by the way, Clay, here's where, the, where a common reading of, across expeditions comes in handy because um, the name Shackleton gave for his camp once, a, once he had to abandon the ship and was just on the ice, was called Patience Camp. 
Now, as a reader and student of Lewis and Clark lore, you will know that when Lewis can't get back through the Bitterroot Mountains on the return journey, he writes in his journal, patience, patience, maybe three times, patience. So th this is uh, ex explorer leadership at, at work. It, just tell, tell, telling the man, maybe just himself, You've got to be patient. It'll be. It'll. It, everything will work out. And of course, uh, there was no except, guarantee that it would, but it did. Except there's no guaranteed food supply. No guaranteed. Although he, it's called Elephant Island because named after elephant seals, which are very rich in fat. And not not only does the elephant seal provide a food source, but also a cooking fuel and a light source. I mean, so the elephant seal. I mean, one elephant seal can provide like about six or seven gallons. Of, of 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 fuel oil and lighting oil, so uh, so they they were not they were not starving, they were marooned. No one knew where they were, but they they were in reasonably good shape health wise. But Shackleton knew that ultimately they would they would run into trouble from sickness or other problems, and so he settles on the idea of sailing uh, eight or nine hundred miles to South Georgia to find some in an open boat that James cared named after one of the sponsors of the transpolar expedition. I mean, it's a long boat. It's got oars. It's got a, it's got a sail or two rigged on it. But it's essentially a big rowboat. I mean, we're talking about open boat. It's an open boat. And in fact, Shackleton's decision on the crew on this, I mean, he took a navigator, smart move, Worsley, the captain of the endurance. He took two or three strong rowers. He took one of the more problematic figures back at Elephant Island. He got him out of the mix because he was not getting along with people, put him in his boat. I mean, that is a genius move, Clay. I mean, that is true exploration leadership. Take the problematic personality with you and, and a couple strong other rowers, a navigator, and he knows where South Georgia is because Cook mapped it. He had been there many times before on his previous voyages. And he sails off. Uh, of course, the winds are westerly. He's south. He's south and west of South Georgia. So he knows if he can get far enough north, the winds will take him to South Georgia, where he knows there is a whaling station and he can get help for his men at Elephant Island at the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. We're going to take a break here, Dave. Uh, this is a fascinating story. People should get out their atlases so they can sort of follow along. We're talking about the period during the Great War, 1914 to 1917, one of the most sensational uh, exploration stories of the 20th century of all time, really. And when we come back in this special edition, one-on-one -on -one with Dave McCandry on the Jefferson R, I want you to tell us how that ship, the Endurance, sank and how it was found. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Dave. So he's in a he's in a, an open boat. He's going to another place where he knows there's a whaling station. He's left some men back at the original place where they got on land after the the, the endurance had been locked up. Quickly tell us how these strands get back together and 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 what happened to the ship. The ship gets abandoned because it's being crushed by the ice. So they're they're, 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 they're floating with the ice pack north, but they, they save enough of the accoutrements of the endurance, namely the shore boats. That's how they, uh, they, they have them on the ice. When the ice breaks, when the ice island they're on breaks it, itself in two, endurance, uh, Shackleton makes the decision, we've got to get to land. And they land on, uh, on Elephant Island there near the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. So they have so they have a boat. They have some supplies, some equipment. They're, they're surviving, but they're not certainly not prospering. He takes one of those shore boats, the James Caird, and uh, rows and sails up preponderantly to South Georgia Island, uh, which is uh, eight or nine hundred miles away across the. This is the windiest, most turbulent ocean surface in the world. But they make it. They come on to the uh, uh, the southwest side of, of, of South Georgia. This island is originally discovered by James Cook. The, the part of the island I'm going to describe is the part of the island Shackleton comes to because the whaling station is on the other is on the northeast side. They sail into the southwest side of the island. So they're not okay yet. They're not okay yet. They got 
So having sailed across open ocean almost a thousand miles, then they have to cross a small island mountain range to get to the whaling station on the other side. So here's what Cook said about this place. Who would have thought that an island of no greater extent than this is situated between the latitude of 54 and 55 south should in the very height of summer be in a manner wholly covered many fathoms deep with frozen snow, but more especially the southwest coast. Now just parenthetically, that's the one that Shackleton lands at. The very sides and craggy summits of the lofty, lofty mountains were cased with snow and ice, but the quantity which lay in the valleys is incredible. Before all of them, the coast was terminated by a wall of ice of considerable height it can hardly be doubted, but that a great deal of ice is formed here in the winter, which in the spring is broke off, broke off and dispersed over the sea. That, by the way, was Cook's great insight into where all the icebergs he saw in the Southern Ocean came from, because he saw them calving off from places like, uh, like, uh, like South Georgia. So Shackleton gets to this icebound coast, but the whaling stations on the other across a mountain range on the other side, and so they they pound screws through their boots and they go on a mountain climbing expedition. All they got is a is a fifty foot rope, and they cr they cross over to um, uh, Stromness, which is the whaling station on the other side. They were at sea from Elephant Island from April twenty fourth to May eighth, and they get to Stromness on May twentieth. So twelve days after landing on the southwest coast of Georgia Island. So they covered a lot of ground in two weeks at sea, and it took them a day or two to cross the island. These are not just icy hills. These are mountains that they're climbing over with inadequate gear to get to this whaling station where there's some hope then of rescue. And then they arrange a, a, a rescue operation to get the remainder of the party, uh, two dozen some guys, still at Elephant Island. The part of it that blows my mind is the crossing of the 900 miles in the open boat. So thank you for that. All right, so now they're rescued. The world is watching. The world has been uh, wondering where they are. Uh, there are telegraphs. There are, there are ways in which this news can travel. Uh, so now go to the ship. The ship was being ground up, crushed by the massive uh, ice that locked it in. What happened to the ship? Well, the, the ship, first of all, uh, uh, is metal. It was found approximately where, where Shackleton had estimated it would have sank. I was in a hotel room a few months ago, and I saw a documentary about an attempt to find uh, the Endurance. And they had created this sub, and they, and they thought they knew where it was, and they sent it down, and they lost the sub. They lost contact with it. And so millions and millions and millions of dollars are being spent by rich people and foundations to do this. And at some point you sort of have to ask what is the value of that? But of course the value of it is that this is such a key moment in the history of exploration. So then when I saw that, I was disappointed. I thought, well, first of all, why is there a documentary about this failed attempt? But, but then just a few weeks ago, we learned that they found it. Um, and now I don't know what they'll do with it. Do you have any idea? I really, I, I really don't know. It's hard to think they can bring it up. I, I think that's unlikely. They might, uh, underwater archaeologists might uh, bring up uh, some key items, some um, prow ornamentation, maybe the ship's bell, things like that. So, David, in, in 1999, a rescue crew was able to pull Gus Grissom's Mercury space capsule out of the Atlantic. You will remember that he something happened uh, the the uh, he, blew, he blew the hatch prematurely it may have been human error we're not quite sure he denied it uh, for the rest of his life but this was uh, early on uh, and 38 years later they were able to pull that vessel from the bottom of the atlantic it's of course much smaller than uh, the endurance but uh, but these things happen and when it happens, it's thrilling. I, and to, so explain to, explain to me and to our listeners why it's thrilling. Why do we care in the way that we do about these things? Well, that, <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a very good question. I'm not sure I can, I can give a, a, a compelling answer to it, Clay. This Mercury capsule, the Liberty Bell 7, went down three miles in July of 1961. That's, you know, 16,000 feet. That's deep. 
Um, very few vessels can go that deep. And of course, you can't send a chain down, um, which is uh, actually they wound up doing something very much like that. But, uh, you know, when I think one of the Apollo moon landings, uh, they came close enough to one of the old surveyors or rangers that they were able to visit it. And there was a thrill to that. There's, a, there's the thrill of seeing the last romantic expedition or capsule or um, footprint from a previous moment in the history of exploration. You and I have felt it out on the Lewis and Clark Trail when you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are in, in a place where they actually were. I can't explain it, but it, it, it's, it's deeply satisfying and even thrilling. And so I get it. And uh, they have found this now. So presumably we're going to learn some things uh, from the reconnaissance of the endurance. Not a lot, I would say. Uh, it wasn't like the USS Maine that blew up in Havana Harbor. It sank and we know why it sank. But still, there are probably things to be rescued from it that will add in some important detail to the story of Shackleton's heroic activity. Uh, I think that this sort of is the very heart of the quest for discovery, right? That that we can't get over the loss of Franklin, not our Franklin, not Benjamin Franklin, but the other Franklin in the Sir Arctic. John Franklin. And we can't get over the suicide of Meriwether Lewis on the Natchez Trace in 1809. And, and, and we can't get over the tragedy of Burton and Speak fighting over who got the source of the Nile. These things have a a potency that outlasts most other stories. We don't feel the same way about uh, radioactivity or um, Priestley's chemistry. It's uh, it's exploration. It's going, to use Cook's phrase, where no man has gone before, that somehow lights something up in the human spirit that is just undeniable, whether we can explain it or not. Yes, which is why one of the great, Shames. I think future historians will puzzle over why, after the great leap forward, <laughs> to coin the phrase, uh, of the 1960s, I'm referring now to the Apollo program, not the Cultural Revolution and Allied stuff in China, why that whole effort petered out. Fundamentally, Clay, I think it's not complementary to modern Western civilization that it was allowed to do so. And in addition to that, first of all, let me say that it, it bothers me so much that we have been dependent on Russian aircraft, spacecraft to get uh, into orbit. Uh, that uh, is deeply offensive, and now we see why that is so offensive from a national security point of view. Now that we're in a Cold War, right on the edge of actual um, armed exchange with Russia, with Putin's Russia. But, but I think that it petered out our space program petered out for a lot of reasons. One of them is, is something that our friend, who is it, uh, Furtwangler, what's his first name, Albert Furtwangler? Albert, Albert Furtwangler. One of, one of the reasons, uh, Dave, is, is something that our friend Albert Furtwangler, who wrote a book about Lewis and Clark, said, and that is that there's a romance in Captain Cook, there was a romance in Ledyard, there's a romance in Lewis and Clark, there's a romance in Shackleton or Franklin, it comes way down with Apollo astronauts because there's telemetry, because they're 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 technocrats, they're engineers. They they they're not raps, rhapsodically uh, describing what they see. That that they were meant to be understated rather than overstated. They were meant to be programmed rather than have the freedom to explore. They were tightly controlled functionaries of the American Cold War space program. And they were not given the freedom to be lyrical in the way that so charms us with other explorations. Almost all of what we've talked about, certainly when we're talking about Cook, Lewis and Clark, Ledger, Humboldt, Speak, Burton, I suppose even Shackleton, is that it's based upon, and certainly this was the case of Robert Falcon Scott's diary after he got marooned on the ice and died in Antarctica, there's a voluminous literary quality to the experience. And how many times have we said that exploration doesn't happen unless it's written about? It's as if it never happened unless it was written about. So uh, there was no literary 
quality to the Apollo program. It was it was a television show at some level. I mean, think about that. Um, and that, that there might be more to unpack than I'm capable of, of unpacking. Uh, and the other part of it that I think just to expand upon, I think your original insight here, Aldrin, Armstrong, I'm not going to say they were functionaries, but they were darn close to it. They were unqualifiedly brave people. I'm not quibbling with that whatsoever. But they were told what to do. They had, a, 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 even in its own time, a vast machinery. They could, the telemetry, the computers that could help them. I guess what I'm saying, Clay, there was, there was no decision making aspect of their voyage to make it particularly memorable, which is why Apollo 11, which ex or is a 13 that explodes in space, that's the Apollo mission that people really seize upon because all of all of that all, that whole that whole structure of support is exploded. Now they're left on their own devices like Shackleton on Elephant Island. Now what do we do? That's why that's such a great story. And in Apollo 11, remember the great moment was when the landing site was inadequate and Neil Armstrong had to take over the controls and he was hovering around the moon and the fuel is running out and they're getting warning lights and he had to step up as a true hero to get a successful landing. And NASA was tearing its hair out. Aldrin was worried because they were getting sight that the, the, the fuel is gone. You've got 15 more seconds. It's when it's when something goes wrong and the human capacity for greatness and 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 uh, resilience steps in that it becomes the great thing, right? That's uh, you're absolutely right. That is the moment of the original moon mission that just grips people. They see the clock ticking down or the fuel level, and and <laughs> Armstrong's up. And he's trying to find a place to land. That is that is. Um, that's a that's a moment that Shackleton could have readily identified. Even now, when I watch it on commemoration nights, and I watch that last five minutes of the of a, the Apollo eleven landing when the Eagle was landing on the moon, I I break into a cold sweat. I know how it's going to come out, but I'm with them. I'm just thinking, land the damn thing, you know, find find a space. And, and and with Shackleton, the reason why we remember this is the disaster. If he had had a successful expedition, we might be talking about it as a footnote, but we would not be talking about it in the way that we're talking about it. The same is true of Burton and Speak. If they had just found the source of the Nile and filed the report with the Royal Geographic Society, it wouldn't be as interesting by far as it is when we know the enormous um, intellectual crisis that this led to in geographic circles in Britain and around the world. And just to extend the analogy, Clay, uh, uh, Cook wouldn't be as compelling figure if he hadn't died on his third voyage. And I think we both agree that if, that if Meriwether Lewis, may, part of the, what makes the Lewis story so compelling is the fact that he also died prematurely, also under mysterious circumstances. So it's ultimately, Clay, it's the human element that we can identify with these stories, the pathos, the bravery, the stupidity occasionally. Uh, that's what that's what brings us to these stories. And uh, and the, uh, the Apollo is kind of a sterile story by comparison. There's no great narratives associated with it to speak of. Uh, so it's a different kind of thing. But um, um, uh, uh, as I, well, I don't need to be convinced that studying exploration uh, is meaningful. Uh, I, uh, uh, it's um, uh, it, it, it's it, it's one of the great narrative devices that the human mind has ever conjured. I just want to say about this story that I mean this with all the accuracy I can muster that in in the Lewis and Clark world, you and I are two of the top ten people, and no need to go into a list, but. You know, we know this story. We've given a chunk of our lives to this story. Uh, we have actually broken some new ground in this story, um, much to the dismay of, 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 of some of the old guard. But when I think about Shackleton and Franklin and Ledyard and Burton and Speak and Baring and on and on and on, Captain Cook, I realize how pitiful 
my knowledge base is, that I know almost nothing, really, about comparative exploration and how can you possibly understand this great dynamic in the human spirit if you are locked into one or two small expeditions that are really on the periphery in many respects of the great tradition. So I congratulate you on your books on Captain James Cook, more to come, and your own story uh, with your son of, um, in a somewhat bourgeois way, going up to the Arctic Circle and dipping your toe. We'll look forward to that book when it's finished. Thank you. Thank you, Clay. I've enjoyed it. You've been listening to this really interesting one-on-one interview with my dear friend, Dave Nicandri, author of several books, including two on the Lewis and Clark expedition and one so far on Captain James Cook. We'll see you next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thank you.